We have learned that at the center of every galaxy, there is a supermassive black hole. Black holes are real places, but sadly, you may never be able to visit one. If we cannot go in person, we can do the next best thing. Black Hole Symphony combines the science of astrophysics together with music to create a journey through space-time that everyone can take together. Mathematics is the most rigorous extension of our logic. I think music is the most rigorous extension of our emotions. This project, like science itself, emphasizes the connection between people. I realized science could sing not just for me, but for millions of other people. I wonder if we should just start, David, um, with sort of an origin story, how this began. Uh, Anna, I think you were a collaborator in this. There are several scientists, so I'm gonna hand the mic to you, David, and maybe you and uh, Anna can uh, tell us the origin story. And especially, I don't think that we uh, started talking about the magnificent imagery in this. Oh, right. uh, and it's really uh, fantastic to think about this as, as sort of a, a multi-media uh, collaboration. Um, and uh, I'm just also curious where all these ideals come from. Well, I think it all started with the jets, didn't it? Yes, it did. It started with two of us just meeting because we all wanted to share science. Uh, and David was uh, already doing incredible compositions. Um, and I was an astrophysicist that didn't have the voice and I couldn't even explain my mom, my mom what I was working on. <laughs> And um, David um, already had this uh, incredible vehicle that he was already working with the Museum of Science, and I heard some of his compositions, and they were just absolutely incredible. And I wanted to tell the story of uh, what I was working on, because all, everything that you have seen is based on data. Those are real places. The black holes are real places. All of those things that's out the, there. Yeah, that, that's the first melody that I wrote. <laughs> yeah, that's the one. That, so Anna e emailed me this, what's the B282, what's it called? It was a beautiful name, B202018, plus 35. That's the name of the, the jet or the, or the black hole itself? That's the name of the entire system. The entire yes. system. The phone number of the, of the system, <laughs> we call it. <laughs> so, you know, I got these numbers and, and I, can, I can take... Uh, you know, more a gamma rays, a higher note, or a lower note for low intensity, and that the melody just kind of popped out, and it it just it spoke volumes. And then you know we just started talking, and that's just one piece of this big puzzle, which is black holes and what they do and what they make uh, in the universe. And just pretty soon, I think we realized it wasn't just going to be jets the piece; it needed to be the whole, well, as big a story as we could tell. There's some things that didn't make it into the symphony because they were discovered after I finished it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what to do to write the sequel, maybe. But, uh, yeah, it started with the gents. So it's a, it's a little like Pluto. It, it either happens or it doesn't happen before, before it happens. It with Pluto. <laughs> that's it, that's it. Um, I, I do want to talk about creativity because I know that you, all of you, and I've, I've had these wonderful conversations with Jim, about creativity, uh, but I also want to encourage, um, if you have a question that you'd like to enter in, we're gonna go to questions. We have a microphone on this side and on this side. If you would go to the microphone uh, and get ready for your uh, question, we'll enter that in uh, to the discussion. But from a scientist standpoint, from a composer standpoint, where do ideals come from? What do we think about the creativity? Well, um, <clears throat> first of all, David, I wanna congratulate you on an amazing accomplishment. Where does creativity come from? I always tell people it comes from the same place that great art comes from, great uh, music comes from. It comes from our dreams. Several years ago, I was in a meeting. Um, I was an advisor to President Obama for, uh, from 2009 to 2016 on his Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And we were in a meeting with um, 
Eric Schmidt. And Eric looked at me and said, uh, in five years, we're going to have computers that do what you do. And I don't remember what I said to him, but I do remember what I was thinking. <laughs> it's not what you think. I thought, not unless they can dream, because that's where our creati creativity comes from. David and I and Anna have all been wrestling with problems, and we talk about the way we get to a resolution. And there's an enormous commonality whether David is trying to solve a musical problem or whether I'm trying to solve a set of mathematical equations that have 4.2 billion parts to them. It comes from the imagination. It's quite remarkable. And I fully agree that it comes from the imagination because our imagination doesn't have boundaries. There is um, not enough, enough dimensions and um, on top of that, what we see with the universe even goes beyond our imagination. So combining that uh, reality that what's out there uh, can even be bigger, it's, it's so, this is where what we can do as a, as a humanity is, is infinite. And uh, for us to be able to make that creativity a reality, for me, from my perspective, it also comes from discomfort. That we are not comfortable, that's not enough. What we have, the tools we have, it's not enough. We need more, we have to join the forces to be able to tell those stories or create new reality. So dreams, but also uh, when we don't dream during the day, that discomfort that we want more. <laughs> I, I do love this idea of, of being inspired across the disciplines, of science being inspired by the art and the music, and the music being inspired. It's, it's less about sort of the linear ideal of communication and more about inspiration, right? Yeah, Jim? JD, can yeah. I add something? Sure. Uh, tell a story perhaps that people in the audience are not familiar with. Some people will be. Um, there was an Indian uh, mathematician by the name of Ramanujan, or Ramanujan, depending on how you pronounce it. And he is the sharpest evidence in history that mathematics comes from dreams. He was able to derive mathematical formula by going to sleep and waking up in the morning and writing them down, or uh, writing them as he was having a you know, dream, and then in the morning looking back at them. How many times have you tried to solve a problem and said, I'll sleep on it? It's the same process. Thanks, Jim. I think we have a question here. Yes. Um, okay, so um, <clears throat> hold on to your hat for this question. It's for all of you. Because, uh, speaking as a scientist and a musician. So hypothetically, if you took the concert that you just did right now, and that music in its perfect form travels however long it gets until it gets to two black holes, which you saw there, before the, before the black holes combine and you have all the space and time being distorted from our perspective, side A, if you'll call it, and since when you get around to the other side of the black hole's perspective, you're there before you left, does that mean that the music theoretically would be upside down and backwards by the time you got there? <laughs> I, mean, I think I would like to hear it upside down and backwards. I think that sounds like a good idea for a piece, but I think I'll let the, the mathematical physicist, do you want to take that one? Well, unfortunately, I'm, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you because, uh, we, first of all, we don't really know all the things that we would like to know. Anna was talking about being frustrated. And one of the things that frustrates people like me the most is that we don't understand how quantum mechanics interacts with black holes. And that's the reason I cannot answer your question. This is the problem of quantum gravity. I'm sure all of you have heard of Stephen Hawking. Stephen spent the entire latter decades of his life trying to wrestle with this problem. You've probably heard of string theory. It's again trying to wrestle with this problem. We don't yet have an answer. Well, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Any, any, other, any, other any more questions? Uh, I'd like to just project, I mean, this is human creativity, fantastic. It's like Woodstock plus 50 years with technology. I'll take but, that. But, but thinking about technology, in five years, what would uh, 
uh, son of the multiverse concert series look like with AI? And how much of what you've got now is possible uh, to be made more accessible with immersive technology, with the, with the, the headphones and the earphones and people grasping through the clouds and stuff? I mean, it seems like yeah. that's cl we're close to that now. Is, is this product something that could be further manipulated? We're certainly interested in VR, and, and in fact, the original version of this show is for a, a planetarium, which is already you know, around you in, in three dimensions, and that can translate to a, a VR headset. We're just waiting for them to get a bit more widespread. You know, it's kind of just, they're just, well, I guess we should all go out and buy one, I mean, <laughs> me included. No, they're, they're kind of pricey, aren't they? So maybe, um, I think the VR is coming. As far as the AI, I'd love for one that could just speed me up. I, I'm so frustrated by how long everything takes me. Uh, you know, this piece was three years uh, in the working, and so much of it was just trying to filter through the complexities to get the music something small that then I can work with, and I can work with instruments that have this classical music culture that goes back a long way. Just, you know, I'm, I'm, I hope the AI will be able to enhance us instead of replace us. I mean, that's the utopia. Um, I haven't found one that's really that helpful for me yet, but if you know of one, composer's aid, do let me know. And just to add to that, um, uh, what the beauty of this project is that the collaboration is still alive. And hopefully we will also include the AI to help us with the visuals, to help us with the text, with the description. Next time I will use AI with, to help you, ChatGDP to help with some of the scripts. Uh, last time we didn't have it. Uh, but also to talk about what we've been trying to achieve with the Black Hole Symphony. We've been trying to tell the story of, um, of the scientists, what, what they're learning today. We involve the entire group of, of people that uh, uh, work are absolute experts in relativistic jets. So they go today and learning new things with the observations. Uh, people who are working on the accretion disk and what are we learning? They postulate hypotheses, they go and uh, get the observations. Still AI is not good with, with creating those hypotheses and testing them. So for us, that part of the collaboration with, with, a musician, with, with David, that, uh, that David was leading that, was taking those stories of what do we know today about, uh, about science from scientists that they're learning that today and, and translating that. So definitely the translation, we could keep adding uh, collaboration, including AI as well. But that part uh, of building this hypothesis and identifying what, what we really know today about those topics, who is leading the way of understanding that and telling those stories and bringing them into, into a format that you can go to those places without actually uh, spending a billion light years, or we don't have that much time. <laughs> but there's a real places, like going to Hawaii. We can go to Hawaii. It's a real place. Also, those places we've been talking about, uh, those objects like B2018, it's, it's a real object. And it's out there, and it's, uh, there is billions of, of objects like that. So we wanted to bring that science uh, in, in the sequence, in the way that uh, we could experience it as a journey. One, one final question. Yes, I'd like to ask each of you, in working on the project, what did you find most rewarding and what did you find most challenging? <laughs> well, uh, this is the most rewarding part. Uh, it's, yeah, being with you all. Um, <laughs> that's an easy one. You know, the, it, it doesn't mean anything until it's shared, you know, and that's probably the same with science and music. Uh, it, you know, they're for everyone, and if they can help each other to, to share uh, and to bring people together to think about these things, then I think uh, that's, that's the mission. Uh, difficult thing, oh, just trying to put all the pieces together. You know, we had all these little kind of vignettes, these little, little stories. And then we, you know, we had to put it into linear time, which unfortunately we're all stuck in linear time. Are we? Maybe. <laughs> we, live, we live from birth to death and we can't go back and forth. But, so we had to create this, this journey and figuring out what came, what came what. And deciding, you probably noticed uh, the, the voice, she appears halfway through. 
and there's a real change in tone when we stop. You know, we've we've kind of had this geographical look at black holes. You know, it's here they are. This is what they're made. This is what they're made of, and and the surrounding sort of structures. But then, you know, we really want to get into well, what what does that mean to us as human beings? You know, what, we know these um, structures of the universe that. Uh, led to our galaxy and, and our home. You know, our, our star is formed from the, the remnants of, of supernovas, and had it been slightly different, maybe it could have collapsed into a black hole. We, you know, we're so lucky to be here and part of this, this intricate dance of, of matter and energy. So finding out just how to change that tone and, and kind of shine the spotlight back, back onto us, um, that's the other half of the picture, so we yeah, kind of agonized over that moment. So you can let me know if you thought it came well. Uh, okay, so there we go, moving on. So I was worried that David will say that the most difficult part was working with Anna. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of collaborative process, which was absolutely exciting. And to me also, it was also my favorite part, because seeing, we started with two of us with the idea that David wants to do symphony, I want to talk about black holes, so let's do black hole symphony. <laughs> and here we are with the Black Hole Symphony, but then also so many other people joined us and the Museum of Science. Uh, we literally accreted a lot of scientists around us that also were part of that journey and now it's a, it's a living process and everybody started, no one was really, uh, David was is, is our leader, uh, but everybody was adding something and it became a project that is keep growing and improving itself and it's getting better, which is so amazing that it's becoming bigger and bigger. It's growing like a supermassive black hole. <laughs> and uh, it's just the beginning of the, of the journey with, uh, with the Black Hole Symphony. So I have been the caboose in this process. <laughs> I was brought on to it very late. And so let me reflect on some things. First of all, I would say that it's important to understand how collaborative, not just this project, but all of science is extraordinarily collaborative. I know people think that a few geniuses go off into dark rooms and have these flashes of insight, but that's not really how science works. I'm 72 years old. I've been doing science for about 50 years or so, so I know that's not how it works. You swim in a sea of information, some of it accurate, some of it not. And the way that you parse that is by interacting with your colleagues. So this project, like science itself, emphasizes the connection between people. You don't get science without those connections. The other thing that I, I was reflect, and as I said, I congratulate David uh, earlier. I told him that only twice in my life have I seen something like this. And the first time I was when I was a teenager, and there was a gentleman by the name of Guy Murchie who wrote a book called The Music of the Spheres. And that was the first time I heard science sing. I was 14 years old. The next time I saw something like this occur was in 1980, when Carl Sagan released the Cosmos series. And then I realized science could sing not just for me, but for millions of other people. And now we have David adding to this list and so now I will be confident that a new generation will cause science to continue to sing to millions and millions of people. I hope so. If there are any composers in the room, you should give it a go. <laughs> I mean, there's, you know, there's a bunch of numbers, but it's not as hard as playing the piano to, uh, <laughs> to get, at least to, to feed some things in and start listening to, to data, which is sort of how this all starts. So if, if, I'm serious, if, if anybody's interested in, in composing science music, uh, drop me a line, because uh, there should be more of us, I think. And one final thing, I've often thought that mathematics is the most rigorous extension of our logic. I think music is the most rigorous extension of our emotions. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Everything Jim just said, we're going to have made up on T-shirts and bumper stickers. Um, please join me in thanking one last time Anna, Jim, and David. And thank you for coming.